On February the 24th, Russian troops crossed the border into Ukraine near the city of Kharkiv. U.S. President Joe Biden responded immediately by announcing sanctions against Russia. We've now sanctioned Russian banks that together hold around $1 trillion in assets. Every asset they have in America will be frozen. The Biden administration insisted, however, that U.S. forces would not get directly involved in fighting the Russians in Ukraine. Even so, on March the 16th, Biden announced an 800 million U.S. dollar package of military aid for Ukraine. And together with our allies and partners, we will keep up the pressure on Putin's crumbling economy, isolating him on the global stage. The U.S. continued providing military aid for Ukraine, amounting to 8 billion U.S. dollars worth by early July. This was more than the U.S. spent during the first five years of its war in Afghanistan. Other Western countries have followed the U.S. example. As you know, we have yesterday decided that Germany will provide weapons to the defense of the country. We will be committing 50 million U.S. dollars to support both lethal and non-lethal defensive support for Ukraine. The Cold War ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Since then, the U.S. has continued to regard Russia as a threat to European security and has constantly pushed NATO to expand eastward. In the past 30 years, the number of NATO countries has grown from 12 to 30. In February, Washington said it would support Ukraine joining the organization. It was this that is thought to have finally led to Russian President Vladimir Putin's decision to conduct what he described as a special military operation in Ukraine. As American political commentator Thomas L. Friedman pointed out, neither the U.S. nor NATO could claim to be an innocent onlooker to the conflict. Не мы кому-то угрожаем, к нам пришли. И теперь еще говорят, нет, теперь и Украина будет. Dass eine NATO-Mitgliedschaft der Ukraine eine rote Linie darstellt, deren Überschreiten Russland nicht hinnehmen würde. Stattdessen haben die Hardliner gefangen in einer völlig überkommenen Logik des Kalten Krieges starr an der Beitrittsperspektive für die Ukraine festgehalten und dabei überheblich Russland den Großmachtstatus abgesprochen. Sanktionen, die den eigenen Bürgern am Ende mehr Schaden zufügen als denen, die damit gemeint sind, werden dem Krieg in der Ukraine kein Ende setzen können. Nach diesem Krieg werden wir mit Russland immer noch auf einem Kontinent leben. The Russia-Ukraine conflict has now lasted for over five months. In that time, an estimated 6 million Ukrainians have fled their country. Since the outbreak of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the United States and several European countries have imposed sanctions on Russia in successive rounds of increasing severity. A key target of the Western sanctions has been Russian energy exports. On March the 8th, the United States led the way, declaring that it would halt all imports from Russia of oil, natural gas and coal. A month later, the European Union announced that it would stop importing Russian coal. Today, I'm announcing the United States is targeting the main artery of Russia's economy. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. Russia is a major player on the international energy market, accounting for 18 percent, 11 percent and 10 percent of global coal, oil and natural gas exports. Before the EU imposed sanctions, around 40 percent of the natural gas, 30 percent of the oil and 20 percent of the coal it imported came from Russia. According to a report by the World Bank in April, energy prices are rising at their highest rate since the 1973 oil crisis. It predicts that the surge may continue until the end of 2024. The war is a serious setback to Europe's strong yet incomplete recovery from the pandemic. 
it left private consumption and investment well below pre-coronavirus forecasts, even as fiscal and monetary support underpinned an impressive rebound in employment, almost to the levels last seen before the pandemic. Norwegian energy research and business intelligence company Rystad Energy has predicted that a complete halt to Russian deliveries will create a natural gas shortfall in Europe, amounting to 155 billion cubic meters each year. Und das heißt, wir rechnen damit, dass sich auch über das Jahr gerechnet die Kosten für Heizung, für Benzin, für Strom nahezu verdoppeln werden für die Verbraucher, für die Betriebe. Und das ist ein, ein sehr großer Geldbetrag und den meisten Mitgliedern, den meisten Menschen ist das noch, noch gar nicht so klar geworden, was das bedeutet. Yet, while Europe is suffering by cutting off Russian energy imports, the United States is profiting. Data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration has revealed that in the first four months of this year, the United States sold 74 percent of its liquefied natural gas output to Europe. Its exports to the European Union and the United Kingdom increased more than threefold year-on-year, reaching an average of 210 million cubic meters per day. As a result, the U.S. now enjoys a 49 percent share of the European natural gas market. Actually, the United States has now two main goals. The first is to completely cut off Russia from Europe. You know, in, in other words, to completely prevent the sale of Russian gas and oil to Europe and also to completely prevent, uh, to completely destroy the economic relations between Europe and Russia. The second goal is the United States wants Europe to suffer significantly from this crisis. So as a result of their increased energy costs in Europe, Western European nations, you know, they will now face serious economic difficulties. So um, by using all these methods, I think the United States wants to make Europe much more dependent on itself. So therefore, the United States wants, I think, complete instability in Ukraine. And they want the war to continue and the insecure situation to worsen in Ukraine. This is what the United States wants. On July the 13th, the exchange rate of the euro against the U.S. dollar fell below parity for the first time in 20 years. Analysts ascribe this to two main factors. One is that the U.S. dollar, which is effectively protected by a powerful military, still represents a safe haven in times of crisis. The other is that Europe's preoccupation with defense issues at the expense of the economy has damaged confidence in the euro. The Russia-Ukraine conflict is being blamed for a rise in international crop prices, prompting fears of a global food supply crisis. Now their breadbasket is being bombed. Russia and Ukraine represent more than half of the world's supply of sunflower oil and about 30 percent of the world's wheat. Ukraine alone provides more than half of the world's food programs with supply. In the U.S., inflation has seen a steady rise this year. On July the 13th, the Department of Labor announced that the Consumer Price Index was up by 9.1 percent year-on-year in June, hitting a 40-year high. Food prices were 10.4 percent higher compared with the year before, the largest year-on-year -year increase since February 1981. Goodness, I hope it's reached the highest point. I don't know that it has, just because I feel like it keeps going up. Um, I don't think it's reached the highest point. I think that's probably still yet to come. I don't think the worst is, is, has come yet. And for example, I went into the grocery store about a couple of weeks ago and I picked up a few small onions. And when I looked up on the register, it said that it was over $5. And I told the cashier, like, this isn't right. Like, this price is 
got to be wrong. Not for the two onions. Two or three onions should not be $5. I hope that this is it. That's my expectation, that it will stop. <laughs> I think the, the biggest sufferers are going to be, obviously, as you said, the poor, a lot of Africa, and of course, the Middle East, which is, is desperate for, for Russian wheat. But the way we're going about things is really just making more problems for the rest of the world, including us. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, social welfare institutions, including food depots, have become a vital source of food for many Americans. Denver, Colorado is a city that has been particularly hard hit. For the many families that are unable to make ends meet, mobile food distribution trucks have become the focal point of their daily lives. I used to buy the, uh, like a big five pound pack and it would be about 11 or $12 and then now it's like 15 or 16. The food bank I go to, they give out tons of food, which is a blessing because um, without that, I don't think that we would be able to make it. Uh, it doesn't have to be this way. There's no real shortage. It is an artificial shortage created by American policy, and the world does not have to suffer. The U.S. government, however, rather than addressing inflation, has instead become preoccupied with foreign policy, in Asia in particular. On May the 23rd in Tokyo, during a tour of Asia, President Biden unveiled the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. The initiative is intended as an alternative to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which President Trump withdrew the U.S. from in 2017. We share the same goal of ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific that will deliver greater prosperity and greater opportunity for all of our children. So let uh, all uh, take all the tasks that we have together, work together, coming out of this launch and to speed our progress toward that goal and work rapidly to develop the first commitments. A White House statement describing the United States as an Indo-Pacific economic power said that expanding U.S. economic leadership in the region was good for American workers and businesses, as well as for the people of the region. However, the IPEF has drawn considerable criticism. Skeptics say it fails to offer any practical benefits, such as tariff cuts, and does not as yet contain any substantial benefits that it can provide to its signatories. I know a lot of the Asian countries have been somewhat skeptical after hearing that, that it, it is not going to allow any greater access to the American market. Um, um, it, what, what is it, what's in it for, for Asia? Why would, one, why would a country sign on to it? Skepticism is not the word that I would use, certainly not the first word I would use in terms of the responses that we've gotten from our trading partners in this region. It is true, uh, we are not bringing discussions and negotiations around tariff liberalization. The United States is not alone in trying to expand its influence in Asia, and so too is NATO. On May the 5th, the Republic of Korea spy agency became the first in Asia to join a NATO cyber defense institution, the Estonia-based Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. On June the 29th, leaders of the NATO member countries and its key partners met in Madrid for a summit to set the organization's strategic direction for the next decade and beyond. For the first time, leaders from the Asia-Pacific region, including Japan and South Korea, attended. I mean that NATO must have a global outlook, ready to tackle global threats. We need to preempt threats in the Indo-Pacific, working with our allies like Japan and Australia to ensure the Pacific is protected. <laughs> Go, go, go.
이용할 만한 한미 동맹의 무력 시위가 한반도에서 어떤 결과를 초래했습니까? 북한의 핵무장을 부르고 DMZ를 위태롭게 하고 이 지역 모두에 다만 기단 한반도뿐만 아니라 이 지역 모두에 군사적 긴장과 불편함을 초래하고 또 평화적으로 협력할 길을 가로막는 그런 장애물로 장애 작용했던 걸 우리 너무도 잘 알고 있지 않습니까? この太平洋国家である日本がNATOしの会談に参加するのか ということですね。これはある意味でアメリカの意向というまあアメリカの要望というところがきっとあったんだろうと思うんですね。つまりこのアジア太平洋地域における日米あるいはあ米韓の一つの軍事同盟というのをまあ NATO という場を使ってアピ